everybody. Welcome back to uh, Live With Me. Took last week off, um, back at it. And today we're talking about um, basically dog bites, when dogs bite, when your dog bites. And um, let's face it, dogs can bite. Nobody wants their dog to bite. There's different scenarios where dogs might bite you know, people in their own home, meaning like family members, other uh, scenarios where dogs might bite strangers, um, and then also maybe other dogs. And what, what, like, what do we do in those scenarios? How do we, uh, do, like, what do we do? What, what's, what's the best course of action, you know, right? When it happens, um, what's the best course of action moving forward? Uh, so I want to talk about these things. And for starters, I want to normalize dog bites. Um, dogs bite. Um, maybe your dog will never bite anything, anyone, any dog. Maybe they will. Regardless, it's normal. Um, dogs have very limited ways of communicating. And a lot of the ways that they do communicate um, are either ignored or go unnoticed. So I'm sure that y'all have all seen videos on Facebook or, or, or photos on Facebook or Instagram or something where um, there's like a picture or a video of like a dog lying on its bed and a person has a young child that's like crawling all over the dog. And, and oftentimes, you know, it'll be like labeled, oh, uh, look at how cute they are. Look how much they love each other. Um, but if you look closely at the dog, the dog is turning its head away. The dog is licking its lips. He is yawning. He is panting. He's got a really kind of hard stare. And, and anybody that recognizes canine body language would look at that and say, ooh, uh, he is not loving that. Um, this is a recipe for, you know, it's not a good recipe. It's a recipe for disaster. So it is so common though for, I haven't seen one uh, in the past week at least, but I've seen them all the time where dogs are displaying the body language that they're uncomfortable. And again, people are not noticing. So what happens if we don't notice it? Well, um, if, if my dog is showing all these stress signs and I'm either ignoring it or I'm saying, hey, stop it, you'll be fine, um, there is a good chance that it's going to escalate to a bite. And then whose fault is that? Well, oftentimes we blame the dog uh, as if it's his fault for biting. And also I see a lot of kind of putting dogs in the position and saying, well, if he does do it, I'm going to punish him and I'm going to teach him that that's bad. And I'll tell you that that is too little too late. Um, that's not going to help because we already have the bite. And assuming that our, you know, the dog that does it, if he has a good mouth and then maybe there's no damage, but punishing him for it leaves him little, little outlets for, for like, he's already trying to display that he's stressed and nervous. Um, he's trying to display it. It's going unnoticed. And then if he does end up, if it escalates to a bite and then all of a sudden he gets severely punished for that, he, uh, I mean, we in the, in the uh, dog training world kind of refer to that as like a ticking time bomb. So now we have a dog that is, has like no means of communicating is uncomfortable. And at no point is a dog just going to go, well, I guess I'll just have to be comfortable with this. That, that's not how it works. So it, eventually it leads to something worse and that that's what it can lead to. But so it's important that we start to read our dog's body language, but um, let's kind of dive into towards people, the most common scenarios that dogs bite would be resource guarding, which is when a dog is in his brain possessing something and, and obvious ones would be toys or food, um, but dogs can also possess a spot. I mean, they can do humans. So like location guarding or human guarding or uh, toy or food. Um, so we have that going on that leads to bites. That's a really common one in the home directed towards people that live there. We've also got uh, like body handling issues. So that could be a dog simply just doesn't like being touched on certain parts of his body. Um, he may also be sensitive to being touched in certain scenarios. So maybe my dog loves it when I massage his ears. I get in there and start massaging it and my dog's moaning and is so happy about that. But as soon as I start walking towards my dog with a, um, a like a, not a squirt bottle, but a uh, eardrops, like, you know, if your dog needs some eardrops or something, as soon as you start walking towards him with that, your dog might get really, really nervous. And so, you know, that can fall into some body handling issues. Um, and then a very common one is like stranger danger. And so we've got dogs that are um, potentially nervous of, of strangers coming in and that can lead to a bite. I think that one of the things that we need to recognize is I hear this all the time. I hear people say, well, he would never bite anybody, but it looks like he might, or he may. 
And I think that's a, there's, that's kind of a naive way of looking at it. There's a very, very good chance that if your dog looks like he's going to bite, that he may actually bite. Um, and to me, like looking like he's going to bite means he, you know, he is growling. He, he looks like he's really ready to, I mean, Oh, I remember watching a video on, uh, I, I don't like actually seek these videos out. I'm, I'm friends with different dog trainers and sometimes they post them. So I see them. It was like a Rottweiler. Maybe it was on whatever Rottweiler. And, and the owner was like holding the, the, the dog's paw and the dog has some serious handling issues, either with the paw or with the clip, the nail clipping, uh, that actual part, but he's holding it. And the dog is just inching closer and closer to his face. I mean, his, his teeth are bearing as much as possible. You could not have a more of a, Arr. and the guy's just like, oh, it's okay. And the dog is getting closer and closer and closer. And I'm assuming that dog has never bit him in the face because I don't think he would be recording this if he hasn't yet. But uh, if you're telling me that that dog may not bite him, I would say you are, you're like, not reading this talk's body language very well. So talk about kind of getting lucky and not having a bite to the face when the dog is inching closer and closer and closer. And he's basically like drooling with his teeth showing. It's a huge dog too. I mean, it's, I'm like, come on, let's, we need to stop videotaping this stuff and showing it off that, oh, it's funny that my dog does this. It's not going to be funny when, when you're, when you get your face bitten. Um, I don't, I don't think that'll be very funny, but anyway, um, so th the main issue is I'm going to, Apparently I'm fired up about this today. Uh, resource guarding, body handling, or stranger danger. So maybe you're at a point you're watching this because you're saying, you're thinking to, my, to yourself, well, my dog definitely is uncomfortable with some of these things and I'm concerned he's going to bite. Maybe you're at a point where your dog is already bitten, you know, maybe one or the other. Um, and it's definitely important. I'm going to go through some information today. I'm not going to jump into how to modify it. That's not a fair thing to do via... A, a live feed, true like behavior modification. There's questions that need to be asked and a careful plan that needs to be laid out. So to say, Hey, you know, when you have a stranger over do this, um, I don't, I don't think that's very wise and that's setting most likely setting the dog up to fail or the, you, the person. And, and just while I'm thinking about it, like an example is, um, my, my dog's afraid of strangers. For example, I, somebody told me to have um, a guest come in and start tossing the, the dog treats. Um, and to, voila, that's going to work. So, and technically the information isn't horrible. It's, you know, let's change the association. I'd say that is correct. Let's change the association, but a lot can go wrong when having a stranger toss your dog treats. Um, I'd say the biggest thing is what if the treat looks pretty enticing. And so instead of tossing it, the stranger goes to hand it to the, your dog and your dog maybe takes it. But all of a sudden, what happens next? Does the person try to touch your dog's head? Um, does the person like make a lot of eye contact? And a lot can go wrong. So um, even if it sounds like good advice, be careful uh, to what you listen to. And a lot of clients that I work with will say, well, I've, you know, I've read this online. There's a you know, long story short, if you're online, there's a lot of advice. Dog training is an unregulated industry. So you got to be careful to what you listen to. Um, and, and, and basically education is important. So make sure that whoever you're listening to is, is educated because there's a lot of junk out there. Pretty much every TV show uh, out there um, lacks education. So you got to be careful with any sort of dog training TV show as well. But um, I got on a little tangent there as well. But long story short, I think if, if you're in a situation where your dog has already bitten, let's say a person, um, it's safe to say that it is most likely going to happen again if this, if it, same scenario presents itself. So if it is, if it's my dog bites people when they come in the house, strangers, that is, I have a good feeling that that's going to continue unless, you know, you put a behavior modification plan in place and you heavily manage. If my dog bites people when he's eating from his food bowl, he's going to most likely continue to bite people if they come close when he's eating from his food bowl. So I think that one piece of advice I can give to everybody, which is a pretty safe piece of advice is one, avoid putting your dog in the position. So if my dog does not like being approached when he's eating from his food bowl, <clears throat> one of the best things I can do is not approach him when he's eating from his food bowl. That, that would be an example of resource guarding. And if my dog has bitten me when I've reached into the food bowl, one of the myths out there is, well, he's trying to prove that he's in charge or something. Throw all that aside. Let's look at what's actually happening. If your dog is biting you when you approach the food bowl, he does not want you near the food bowl. Plain and simple. There's, we don't need to dive deeper and thinking, 
well, it's because this or that. It's, it's simply your dog doesn't like you near the food bowl. Um, it, it's kind of like if you have something you really like and you're like, hey, please don't go near this. I, I don't want you near it. I don't want you to break it. Whether it's something that you built, like a, know, like a toy, like a, I don't, whatever, something that you built that you don't want anybody near, you might guard it and say, hey, please don't go near that. I don't want you to break it. Dogs, you know, are animals, so, so are we, but they can't just say, hey, I don't, I don't really like it when you come near my food bowl. What they can do, though, is via body language, either tense up, growl, freeze over the bowl, or of course, bite if you come too close. So let's start off at least by managing and just leaving them alone when they eat. Um, I'd, I'd say the food bowl thing is, is one of the things that we, you know, we do work to prevent against in, in regards to like puppy class and everything. Um, but it's really in a lot of ways, unless you have like a lot of people over your house when your dog's eating, or if you have young children or something, uh, in a lot of ways, it's not as big of a deal as people make it out to be. Um, it doesn't, uh, there's no like status symbol. If I, if I can reach into my dog's food bowl when he's eating, that doesn't make me any better than somebody that they can't reach into their dog's food bowl. It doesn't change the way that your dog looks at you either in the sense that, oh, well, I, I know my human's the top dog. My human's in charge. I'm not going to mess with them if they reach into my food bowl. Or in the other instance, hey, um, I'm the top dog. You can't reach into my food bowl, human. It doesn't really calculate that way. It is simply with resource guarding. This is an item that I like. I don't want you near it. And resource guarding is um, something that can happen directed towards humans, directed towards dogs, both. I mean, so that is one example. Um, let's avoid putting them in the position. If we want to work through it and actually help to change their association and modify the behavior, uh, in most cases, that is a doable goal. In most cases, it's, it's, uh, it's realistic to assume that you can do that but it has to be carefully laid out. And again, um, you know, there could be advice that you could read online. Well, if your dog guards um, from, you know, guards when you approach him when he's eating, go ahead and just, you know, hand feed him for the next couple of weeks. Um, hey, Kate, go ahead and hand feed him for the next couple of weeks and that's going to solve it. You know, there's advice like that out there where hand feeding has nothing to do with approaching when a dog's eating. So they're not going to be connected. Hello, Kate, what did you say? You said, what do you say to people that, what do you say to people that say the dog will stop when he knows he's getting food regularly. Like if he's had to compete for food as a puppy or a street or a street dog. Oh, so like, yeah. So sometimes if I'm understanding this question correctly, Kate, it's like sometimes people will say, well, my dog guards because, you know, he kind of, as Kate mentioned, yeah, as a puppy, he had to like compete for it. So there's a lot of puppies and he really had to, to compete for it or as a, as a street dog or whatever. So basically like the, the thought process is the food is, is like scarce and, 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 once he realizes that it's not that he might stop guarding it. Um, I, if someone's, you know, if someone says like something like, well, this is why he's doing it. I'll typically say, well, sure. Maybe, um, you know, I, I don't know if, if something to do with that, but ultimately what I say to people is let's look at what we can do moving forward. And that's when we'll jump into like behavior modification for it, or again, or heavily managed. So, um, so, but to, to, to like assume, like, as, as Kate mentioned, like to assume that once he realizes he's being fed regularly and he's got food regularly, that it's going to stop. I mean, that's quite the assumption, maybe in a once in a while that happens, but I would say it's very unlikely. Uh, and I would say that in, in the vast majority of cases, we have to manage slash modify it. Um, if we want to, again, we could just manage. Good question, Kate. Kate is going to be going live tonight on her Rescued by Training page, if anyone wants to check that out. I think it's at 8 p.m., Rescued by Training. Um, so with, but, but you know, if, if, if we have guarding, again, I'm, I'm not going to jump into like behavior modification for it, but at the very least, we, we can start managing or need to if we already have a bite. Uh, and there's different severity, levels of severity to it. I mean, some dogs are only going to like guard their bowl if you come really close. Other dogs might, if you enter the room, start guarding. So it's, it can be kind of all over the map, but at the very least we can start managing. And so like, what about if, if our dog, my dog has bitten a stranger that's coming in the house? Well, there's different levels of like what actually happened. Did the, did, did your dog, was my dog like on the couch, just hanging out and, you know, just being, you know, hanging out there and the stranger came all the way up and started like petting him. And then my dog with the stranger, well, that's one thing compared to as soon as the stranger enters the house, my dog runs up to the door and starts barking, barking and bites, you know? So there's different levels to it. Um, if I have a dog that, uh, is on the couch, for example, and, and if a person approaches, then, you know, the stranger makes him nervous, for example, and he's going to bite, 
there's, there's different options. I mean, I could be like right out of the gate. Hey, don't approach my dog on the couch. I'll bite you. <laughs> I could just flat out say it. Um, I could manage by putting a gate up around him. So therefore he can't be approached or, or approach closely. Um, we could do muzzle training. Um, ultimately that's all types of management and we can also do behavior modification. But if, if I have a dog that is barking and charging at strangers coming in and you know, I need the stranger in because it's the plumber or, or whatever. I am best. The best option is probably to go ahead and just ahead of time, have my dog set up in a comfy place that he enjoys with some things that he likes. So he doesn't have to go through the stressful event and therefore managing to prevent the bite from happening. I think that's probably sound advice in regards to any sort of, um, repair person, because, in most cases, the repair person is never going to come back or maybe once in a blue moon. And so to, to try to like change an association with, with that one repair person is probably not even worth trying. But if, if, if you're dealing with, you know, friends that are coming over and you want to help change your dog's association, then that's something you can work towards. But again, I'm not going to get into that today, but management is something you can do. And, and I, I said it earlier, but like if your dog has a, a, a good mouth, meaning they can bite with limited to no damage, um, I still manage heavily, but I feel a little bit better than if my dog has a mouth that has resulted in damage before. I'm definitely going to do muzzle training. I'm definitely going to have, you know, multiple, I'm going to have two doors in between my dog and the, and the stranger just to prevent anything from happening. So, you know, manage quite heavily. Um, if you have body handling issues, like my dog is sensitive to having his feet touched in general, or my dog doesn't like having eardrops put in, that's more tricky. Um, I would say, that's something that we do have to be proactive with. I mean, in general, having a dog with sensitive uh, sensitivity to having sensitivity to having his paws touch in general, you would probably think isn't that big of a deal, but as soon as you need to work on um, trimming nails, or if my dog injures its paw and I need to look at it, whatever nails, uh, I actually have a really good video of, I, hey, hey, Dr. Elian, a really good video of, I'm working with this uh, German shepherd named Brutus, who's like 10 months old now. and he, he hasn't had any issues with his nails because I was very proactive about it. I've known him since he was a puppy. He's about 10 months old. I think I just said, and I like to teach dogs how to lie down and stay and stay for basically having their nails filed or trimmed. And so I'll probably do one of the uh, a segment on one of those because it's a lot of fun. And you could take dogs that are very sensitive to having their nails trimmed and get them to actually um, kind of enjoy, or at least really, really tolerate having their nails done. Um, but if you do have body handling issues, it's something that you probably want to get working. Uh, you probably want to get started working on sooner than later, because it's one of those things where if my dog struggles with having his nails trimmed, and then I'm stuck in a position where I really got to get the nails trimmed, nothing good is going to come from that in terms of helping my dog feel better about it. So if it's like, oh man, got to get the nails trimmed, let's bring them to X, Y, and Z. And so that way they can just throw them in a muzzle and hold them down and get it trimmed, it's going to make it worse in the long run. So it's something you really want to be proactive with. And, and it's really about changing associations. And again, I'm not going to dive into that today. Uh, I've got a couple questions here. My dog will get worked up during walks. He will turn and bite whoever's walking him. It seems like the leaves falling and too much going around him might be triggering it. Any suggestions? Um, Ron, I mean, uh, well, how, like how old is your dog? Is it definitely like a quote unquote, more of an aggressive bite? Could it be a play bite? Um, if it's like a younger dog, he might just be turning around and having fun biting a leash and biting hands in a play biting style. Um, if something is stressing him and he's turning around and redirecting back to the human, that would be another story. So there's a lot of questions I'd have to ask in regards to that. Um, but I mean, I would start off with probably decreasing walks in terms of actually going anywhere and starting off like staying in the yard and, and practicing stuff there. That's kind of a hard question to answer kind of regardless of whatever information you give me. Um, but ultimately there's things that could be done. So if there are things that are stressing your dog, we would work on changing his association with those things that are stressing him. So instead of looking back at you and trying to like, um, in, in like a redirecting fashion and redirecting the stress back onto you with, with his teeth, we could work on changing the association. And then he would look back at you and in a, in a in an anticipatory way. So he's actually happy and he's like, Hey, there's the thing. Let me look back and get a snack, for example. So depending on the scenario, I mean, there's different things that could be done. 
Uh, Michelle, do you believe it is possible for a human to be the resource they are guarding, as in guarding one particular human in the household from others? Yeah, I've seen it. Um, I mean, it might be less common, but I've, I've seen it. So um, I'd say it's definitely possible. And, you know, it might, in some cases, dogs will guard the humans if they're like sitting on their lap. Um, and, you know, when they're really comfortable on the human's lap. Um, but yeah, I've, I've seen it. So I'd say it's possible. Um, so that makes it tricky too. Cause like, you know, I mean, go to give my wife a kiss and my dog is right there in her lap and, and my dog growls or something like that. But yeah, I've, I've seen it. And so depending on what's going on, I mean, you manage at least for now, uh, and then we can put like a behavior modification plan in place, um, to help change the association. Um, and again, like, it's not fair for me to try to pick apart, uh, with like actual, any sort of, any sort of aggression or whatever. I'm, I'm not going to try to pick it apart, um, in this case and, and try to give solutions. Um, but you know, I, I will give management advice. So, you know, if my dog is turning around and bite, turning around and biting me on the walk when something's triggering it, then at the very least, I would probably stop walking him and figure out, you know, okay, what are the triggers? What, um, you know, can I, can I turn the triggers into something that predicts good stuff for my dog? Um, you know, if, if something is truly stressing my dog so much that like a leaf falling down, for example, is causing him to turn back and legitimately bite me, um, then that's something I would probably, um, you definitely would need like a, a consultation with. And we'd probably talk also about like, maybe we should look at like a, a meds consult too with your vet if, if the stress level is that high that quickly. But so, yeah. There's a lot to be said about this stuff. Um, I want to also talk about, this is going to bleed into what I kind of some of the stuff I just said, but like dog to dog bites. So like maybe your dog has been another dog. Um, I think that's easier for people. Like if your dog is, is dealing with dog aggression compared to human aggression, I think it's a lot easier in general. Um, I think it's less stressful because if you do have a dog that really is stressed when anybody new comes over, that's a lot to handle. Um, whereas if your dog simply just is not good around other dogs, it's a lot easier. You just avoid being around other dogs is one solution. Um, you know, you don't have anybody bring a dog over your house or, you know, if you're walking, you can at least avoid dogs on walks and turn to go the other way. Of course you can work on behavior modification as well, but it's a lot easier. I would say with dog, dog aggression than, than human directed, but so a couple of things I take into consideration is like what, you know, if there has been a bite, what's the severity of it, is, you know, and what's the situation if, if I'm walking my dog down the street and an off leash dog runs up and my dog bites that dog and doesn't do any damage, I'm not personally too concerned about that. Um, I do carry spray shield on me, which is condensed citronella. It's in a little can. So if an off leash dog comes running up, I will spray it to make it go away. I don't want to I don't want, I don't know what would happen if not, would my dog bite that dog? Is that dog going to come up and bite my dog? So I just try to stop it before it starts. I don't like spraying dogs, but I would rather do that than, than the unknown in that case. But so if, if my dog has bitten, so if my dog, if the one, if I'm walking my dog and an off leash dog runs up and my dog bites that dog and does a ton of damage, I think the most responsible thing for me to do, even though it's not my dog's fault is to muzzle my dog whenever that potentially could happen again. Um, I think that's the, the fairest thing to do because my dog um, may have what we'd kind of call a bad mouth, meaning my dog lacks um, the ability to inhibit its bite. So therefore, if it happened again, he's going to do a lot of damage. Um, and, you know, what if, what if that dog that's running across the street is, you know, a, a four month old puppy that the, the, the owners are just realizing that their puppy is no longer going to stick with them all the time. And that puppy runs across the street and my dog who is, let's say nervous of other dogs, um, and doesn't like when they come in his face, my dog bites that puppy and does a ton of damage. Um, I could say, well, the puppy should have been unleashed. Well, regardless, that puppy is probably going to be scarred, um, uh, potentially for life physically, like if a lot of damage is done, but I would, I would say more importantly, uh, mentally my, that, that puppy is going to be pretty, pretty well damaged as well. So it's probably fair to say that we should, if your dog um, has bitten in the past, uh, and I'm saying this more towards dog, dog aggression, but it really bleeds into, to, if it happened toward a human, if they've bitten in the past and they've done a lot of damage, uh, a muzzle is, is really probably the responsible thing to do. If you go that route, a basket style muzzle is what I would recommend, which is more of like, 
it, it, it's beefier, but it allows your dog to open his mouth, pant. He can drink water. He can take treats through it, um, which is really, really important, especially if you're trying to change associations. Um, and also if you're walking and it's hot outside or something, we cannot, it's, it's not humane to walk a dog outside when it's hot with some sort of a, a muzzle that keep that physically prevents him from panting. That's, that's not something that should be done. So a basket style muzzle, there's different ones out there like Baskerville and is it Bumas or do, uh, Bumas, B-U-M-A-S. There's lots of different ones. And, um, but nonetheless, that's, that's pretty important. So that, you know, if, if management is really, really important. So what if and that that's a form of management, but if I have a dog that I'm walking, let's say, let's say I'm walking my dog and my dog is very, very reactive towards dogs. So reactive that he's has a history of slipping out of something and getting over there. Well, if, that, if that's the case, then I need to have multiple forms of management in place. I need to have, um, my favorite is the freedom harness because it has this anti-slip mechanism. So the leash that goes onto the back of the harness will actually tighten up. If, it, if, if the leash tightens, the harness will tighten. And I've, I've never seen a dog get out of a freedom harness when the leash is attached to that. Um, so I like that. I also like a gentle leader. So if I need to, I can change directions and go pretty quickly. Um, and I've got the anti-slip on. And the gentle leader can even go um, under the muzzle. So that can be, you know, on there as well. That's assuming that you, you know, if I still want to walk my dog and get him some sort of enrichment, but there's the the case that he's going to see another dog. I don't think it would be fair, especially in the early stages, if I'm going to walk my dog and knowing that he's got a lot of issues with other dogs, I don't think it would be fair to walk my dog past house after house that has dog, 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 or in an area that I know there's going to be a lot of dogs. That's, that's kind of setting up my dog to, to fail. It's just going to make them quite miserable. Um, so you can also manage by picking areas that aren't heavily dog trafficked, um, and then manage by having them in the correct gear, because if not, you might, uh, you know, if your dog, like if, if you know, your dog has a bite history and has done a lot of damage and you are walking them in gear that they might slip out of, you're setting everybody up to fail yourself. You're setting your dog up to fail. So make sure you have them in the proper gear. So I mentioned again, the freedom harness. I like it because the part in the back has um, a martingale, I guess is what you'd call it style. So if the leash tightens, the harness itself will tighten. So therefore it really can't come off. And I've seen a lot of dogs slip out of harnesses, especially back attaching harnesses. A lot of them have figured out how to kind of put their head down and put their arms forward and the harness will just slide off. Once they've figured out how to do that once, they will quickly try to go back to that same move to get it to happen again. So look out for it. But the freedom harness I've seen really prevent that. And then the gentle leader as well. I think those are important tools to kind of safely manage your dog on walks. Uh, again, I would say spray shield is another important tool um, if you know you are worried about dogs running up to you. Again, manage to by picking the best place to walk. So kind of to summarize everything though, if your dog is bitten before, I think it is your responsibility to manage kind of carefully or closely. Yes, there are scenarios where maybe the, the, the cards stacked up incorrectly for your dog and Maybe in general, your dog is never bitten, but he bit at, you know, the vet, no offense, Dr. Eileen, but you know, if, if, um, you know, they're stressed in general, they've got a hurt foot and they're being examined and they bite like, so, you know, we don't want them to bite, but it makes sense. You know, how many people are really injured and someone goes to look at it and they say, don't touch it. Um, you know, so that, that kind of stuff makes sense. And maybe, you know, that doesn't mean your dog is randomly just going to start biting other people or other dogs or something, but we got to manage carefully. If you're dealing with this type of stuff and you really truly want help um, and you want a formal game plan, you know, that's something we can work on um, one on one. And I do that stuff mostly remotely. So that's something you can reach out, check out the website, dogskevin.com, and we can get it set up. Um, but in general, dogs bite. Um, I don't think if a dog bites that they're a bad dog. I think that if they're biting, they're uncomfortable with something and they're trying to get that thing to go away. Um, and then we can help by either avoiding the scenarios, which in some cases that's fine. For example, if my, my one dog guards his bowl, his food bowl from other dogs, I can, and let's say it takes three minutes to eat the food. So then just keep them separated, let them eat, pick up the bowls and we're good. So that, that will solve it. And, and you don't necessarily need to go into this whole behavior modification thing. Um, but in some cases, just management's fine. In other cases, you know, you might want to work on behavior modification. So that's a quick one on, or it's not really quick, but that's what to do if your dog's bitten, or at least some ideas for y'all. Uh, again, don't think that you have a bad dog or anything. Dogs bite, they have teeth. Um, that's what they do. Um, we can work heavily on preventing it with a lot of socialization and a lot of, you know, resource guarding prevention and all that fun stuff. Um, but nonetheless, it can still happen. So if it happens with your dog, 
don't feel like they're a bad dog. Uh, it is what it is. We can manage. We can potentially modify it as well. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the thread here. And if you need help, uh, the website is on the Facebook page, but we can get a console going. So thanks so much for watching. I'll see you all next week. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.